On to our next High Renaissance superstar. Michelangelo lived to a ripe old age, and as a result, he kind of complicates our unit planning, since his later work really belongs to the era of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. So I'm going to return to his dark last judgment when we get to mannerism in Unit 9. Like Leonardo, Michelangelo was an artist who not only reflected, but also transformed his times. Indeed, he's the first Western artist whose biography was published while he was still alive. He was also the first artist whose art made him, in modern terms, a multimillionaire. Also like Leonardo, Michelangelo's roots lie in the early Renaissance, and more specifically, the Florence of Lorenzo de' Medici. He was born in a town near Florence and apprenticed to Girlandio. Do you remember that other Last Supper we just saw? Lorenzo de' Medici recognized his talents, invited him to join the art academy his grandfather Cosimo had founded. It was actually the first permanent painting school in history, and even invited Michelangelo to live in the Medici Palace. When Savonarola's followers succeeded in banishing the Medici from Florence, Michelangelo traveled to Venice, to Bologna, and finally to Rome, where he arrived at the age of 21 and would work for much of his life. So this is a good point to pause in my biography to talk a little more about the Eternal City's revival. During the medieval period, Rome was a one-industry town, and that industry was the church. Most of the consumers were pilgrims. When the popes decamped to Avignon during much of the 14th century, Rome went into a steep decline. When the papacy returned to Rome, permanently to Rome in the 15th century, a series of strong, if not especially spiritual, popes led a drive to rebuild the city and especially its religious buildings. These popes were heavily influenced by the Renaissance ideals, and they also helped shape the emerging Rome-centered High Renaissance. The pope we will most concern ourselves with this class and the next is Julius II, who was pope from 1503 to 1513. Throughout his spectacular ten-year reign, the so-called warrior pope devoted himself to expelling foreigners, unifying the papal states and expanding their borders, and creating a new Rome in accordance with his conception of high Renaissance splendor. He took the name Julius to show his admiration of Julius Caesar, not a notable Christian saint. The drive to beautify and glorify Rome would acquire new urgency when Martin Luther began to challenge church authority, although ironically the crisis that provoked the Protestant Reformation was German objections to papal efforts to raise money to rebuild St. Peter's by selling indulgences. Stay tuned. The College Board did not include any Michelangelo sculptures on its list, but Michelangelo himself preferred sculpture to painting, really considered himself the sculptor, not a painter. And as we'll see, his Sistine Chapel paintings, our required works, sometimes look a lot like sculpture. This Pietà is a personal favorite and the only work that Michelangelo actually signed. It was this sculpture that catapulted Michelangelo to fame and attracted the interest of Julius II. Today it sits in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. In 1502, Michelangelo returned to Florence, where he produced his iconic David. This statue is 16 and a half feet tall without the base. Like the Pietà, the David was instantly hailed as a masterpiece. In fact, the cathedral, Florence Cathedral authorities convened a committee. It included Botticelli, Filippino Lippi, remember the naughty angel, and Leonardo da Vinci to decide where the statue should be placed. Leonardo wanted to put it in an obscure corner. He was apparently jealous of Michelangelo. In return, Michelangelo, not entirely unfairly, accused Leonardo of not being able to finish any of his great ideas. Leonardo lost, and the committee ultimately chose a spot beside the main entrance to the Piazza della Signoria, or Town Hall. It stood there until 1873, when it was removed to a museum for safekeeping. Michelangelo's David is not on the list, but it shows up in several College Board practice questions, as you've seen. Go figure. You need to know this iconic work. Michelangelo would have been very familiar with Donatello's work, produced 60 years earlier. So how has he departed from Donatello's vision? Michelangelo's David is much larger, really colossal in size. Both Davids are nude, but Michelangelo's sculpture did not provoke the same unease as Donatello's did. 
This may be partly because Florentines had grown more accustomed to nudity. But it also seems to me that Michelangelo's David has none of the disturbing pedophiliac undertones of Donatello's work. Although the stance is superficially similar, Michelangelo has chosen a very different point in the narrative. Not the moment of victory, but the moment when David winds up to fire his slingshot. Note how one side of his body remains closed and relaxed, but the other side is poised, tense, and ready to spring. The body stands in a resilient curve, like a strung bowstring. The hands and feet are oversized, which renders them both more protective and more expressive. Remember, too, that the statue was designed to be seen from below, and Michelangelo designed his David to focus our eye on the two elements of his victory, the head that came up with a plan and the hand that executed the plan. So we see a brilliant brain directing a fit and agile body, which is the Renaissance ideal. We're going to see this again in Michelangelo's Sistine paintings. In 1505, Michelangelo was called back to Rome by Pope Julius II, who gave him a commission to build a truly over-the-top tomb for a not especially modest pope. On the top left, you see a computer image of Michelangelo's original plan for the tomb. On the bottom right is the tomb finally erected in a Roman church, not St. Peter's, and most of it not sculpted by Michelangelo. He did, however, create the powerful, evocative Moses in the center of the tomb, another favorite of mine. Michelangelo was furious when the Pope suddenly canceled this project. He probably ran out of funds. At any rate, Michelangelo ran back to Florence, taking a big chunk of the Pope's money with him. But then in 1508, the Pope was call, called him back to Rome, this time to paint frescoes for the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel is the private chapel of the Pope located between the Papal Apartments and the Basilica of St. Peter's. It is here that the College of Cardinals meets to select a new Pope. The chapel was built by Pope Sixtus IV, hence the term Sistine, in the late 15th century, but the original ceiling was simply blue with stars. The lower walls were decorated by a series of mostly Florentine artists. The end wall, which we see here, the Last Judgment, was also painted by Michelangelo between 1535 and 1541. Again, we will discuss this work in more detail when we get to Manor Star. Walking toward the altar, one passes from the life of Noah to a life of Adam to the creation of the world, a reverse sequence from the chronological one in Genesis. The priest standing at the altar would, of course, see it in the right direction, but upside down. Either way, this compositional plan ensured that the expulsion from the garden falls directly above the gate that separates the laities and the priest sections of the chapel. The creation falls directly above the altar. On the curved side, in those triangles, Michelangelo painted sibyls, prophets, and the ancestors of Christ. Everything that looks like architecture is an illusion, by the way. It's all created by painting. Michelangelo frankly, was terrified by this commission. He hadn't worked in fresco since he'd been trained as a teenager apprentice 20 years earlier, though, 20 years earlier, and the Pope, moreover, had suggested that he paint scenes from the New Testament. Michelangelo thought the Pope's plans lacked drama. He persuaded Julius II to cover the ceiling with Old Testament narratives instead, from creation through the flood and Noah's Ark. The technical challenges were enormous, Painting on wet plaster required an artist to work quickly and accurately. It was difficult to gain a good sense of perspective working on a ceiling, although contrary to legend, Michelangelo stood rather than lay on his back on his scaffolding. His diaries report that he experienced four years of constant back pain. His diaries also report nonstop fights with the Pope over artistic decisions and over money. This brief video clip uses actual language from Michelangelo's diary. And here, I enjoyed this, is a poem that Michelangelo wrote about the pain he suffered during this work. He doesn't exactly mince his words, does he? Okay, I admit that I'm puzzled by the College Board's decision to choose this as one of the required Genesis, Genesis panels from the Sistine Chapel. The flood was the first panel that Michelangelo painted, and art historians pretty much agree that it was Michelangelo's worst panel as well. And that was certainly Michelangelo's view. After this section of the ceiling was unveiled and he had a chance to see this panel from below, Michelangelo was dismayed, and he resolved to make major changes in the way he painted the rest of the panels. 
So what do you think would be the problem with this composition, looking at it from Michelangelo's eyes? Well, mostly it was just too busy and too hard to see way up on the ceiling. The figures were too small. Let's compare for a moment with the creation of Adam, which is widely viewed as the masterpiece among the Genesis panels, and was the first panel that Michelangelo painted <clears throat> after he got a good look at his flood. So, <coughs> excuse me, what differences do you observe? The creation panel is much simpler, but it's also more dynamic. The figures are large enough that we can make out some facial expression as well as the beautifully modeled musculature. Somehow the creation panel also seems to capture the Renaissance enterprise. Humans empowered to think, to create, and of course to sin and fall. God is the instrument, but man is God's creation and in some ways his partner as well. Here again, as with David, Michelangelo is all about the action that is about to happen and our anticipation that Adam's new life will emerge at any moment. In the flood panel, the male nudes are a nudie on the frame below. The flood almost overpower the biblical story. They really draw the eye too easily. But now that I have seized the rare opportunity to diss Michelangelo, let's try to see some of the strengths of this work. Here again, we detect Michelangelo's humanist agenda. He has not portrayed the soon-to-be-drowned humans as evil characters. These are real people pleading for help, assisting each other, seeking shelter, and hoping somehow for rescue. Here we see a mother cradling a baby and trying to protect her child from the rain. A man carrying his wife he hopes to safety, a boy climbing a tree, but of course the only hope lies with that odd boxy arc at the back of the painting. So what is going to happen to the people raising a ladder to get in? Are they members of Noah's family? Will the ladder be pushed back as the ark sails? There's a lot of drama here. Our second required image from the Sistine Chapel ceiling is one of the Sibyls, which Michelangelo placed alongside the prophets because the Greek mythological seers were also thought to have foretold the birth of Christ. Again, we see the marriage of classical and Christian themes that is so characteristic of Michelangelo and the Renaissance. The Delphic Sibyl is the youngest and most beautiful of the Sibyls. She presided over the Temple of Apollo in the Greek town of Delphi, where it was long customary for the priestess, or Pythia, <coughs> as she was called, to be a young woman <coughs> excuse me, selected from a family of poor country people. The Sibyl is carefully, really sculpturally composed. To achieve balance in the space, Michelangelo makes the Sibyl turn her lips in one direction and her face and gaze in a countering direction. Her lower body is mostly static, but her upper body twists in a broad, sweeping, arching motion, echoed by the open scroll and the swollen cloak. Michelangelo uses strong color contrast to draw our eye toward her twisting shoulder, while chiaroscuro and Trump Doyle architectural features enhance the sense of volume. Probably the prophetic scroll she's reading predicts the coming of Christ. So why doesn't she look happier about this? I don't know. Maybe it's because the reign of Apollo is coming to an end. However, there are other pictures of the same Sybil carrying a crown of thorns, showing that she predicted the sufferings of Christ. So maybe this is the meaning of the sorrowful expression of these eyes. So, notice anything about Michelangelo's women? To me, it looks a little like they're trying out for women's pro wrestling or maybe ingesting some controlled substances. Really, all of Michelangelo's figures look a little like statues, and he used male models for both men and women. Just FYI, this is one of the two works that you might end up analyzing in your Unit 8 essay. The other work is The Last Supper. As always, Canvas's randomizer will make the